Welcome to um, From Linked Art to Text and Back Again, an Unsupervised Approach with William Thorne, who is studying a joint PhD between the University of Sheffield and the National Gallery in London in information extraction, organization, and sorting of art historical text collections. The key area of research interests are in reducing uh, populational data and uh, data class of language models and unconventional training and strategies. I will remind you that you can put questions in the chat as well as in Slack. William, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and I think today is a perfect example of my, my interests. It's a very niche training mechanism and it's quite lightweight for what it does. So yeah, I'll be presenting some work which has been on the back burner, I'd say, for quite a while, but has taken my primary focus over the last few months, um, which is basically trying to learn the translation between text and linked data, which is a very challenging task, and there's not a lot of mapped data sets for this, um, but I'll cover that a little bit more in the motivations. So I will go over the problem a little bit more, why we're doing this, um, and then give a brief discussion of uh, unsupervised versus supervised, and in particular, the pipeline versus the end-to-end -end approach. That was a major decision for me. Um, and then we'll look at cycle consistency training, our particular take on the method and what we're contributing to the field in this way. And then we'll finally go over uh, the data, which is probably what you're all here for. Um, so there are a lot of very large collections of uh, structured data and also of free text data, but nobody's ever gone down and, and just sat down and just marked which ones are paired with which. Um, and, you know, for people who are unfamiliar with linked data, this can also be a pretty significant problem because they don't know how to read it. They don't have access to a lot of the data that is available on the internet to everybody. Um, and annotation is expensive. And you know the, now with with language models, it's almost getting to the point where we can automate a lot of the work, and then we can spend less on fixing it, um, which is kind of the approach that I'm I'm taking here. So this is a lot of text. I'm not going to spend too much time here, but the main difference between supervised and unsupervised training is that with supervised training you have the input and what the output should be. In unsupervised, we don't have that luxury. We only have an input and we have to work out how we can calculate an output that looks reasonable for, for the input. Um, so there, there, I'd say there's two broad categories. It's kind of the pipeline approach. This is what's been very traditional through NLP um, in the entity extraction uh, pipeline. You might have named entity recognition, entity linking and uh, co-reference resolution, whatever. But it, the benefits of it are that you can have a lot of people working on a lot of different components at the same time. You can benefit quite a lot from other people's work because you can take their named entity recognition tool and then you can build it in your pipeline and get going. But the main problems are that you get accumulated error with every single stage that you add. And also it does not transfer easily to a new domain because you can't guarantee that they have every single one of those sub stages of your pipeline. Um, in the end-to-end -end approach, we don't need the pipeline because the feature extraction process embedded within the model itself uh, just intrinsically learns a lot of these relationships that we're trying to teach. Um, by learning through an external metric as well, we often learn multiple different tasks at the same time, like this one. And it's quite easy to transfer. You just have to lightly fine tune it, or you just have to tune it on reasonably readily available data in the in the sector. But as I'll come to discuss, these approaches are much, much harder to diagnose. And none of the problems that you face are independent of one another. So improving one factor will potentially negatively impact another one. Um, so as a brief overview of the training mechanism, uh, I will start with the linked data to text to linked data cycle. Um, so in the first case, we give a real piece of graphical data to our linked data to text model, and it generates a sample, which we then feed into our other model as if it was real, 
but we know it's synthetic. And we try and get it to do what it's it's been learning to do, which is to generate an input or you know a valid piece of linked data which represents the text that it has received. And so now we've got the real graph and we've got the um, predicted graph. So we've now effectively got a sample and a label and we can now update the text to a uh, linked data model. And it will be the opposite for the other uh, for the other uh, of cycle. But the, the loops do keep going. Um, so between each cycle, you switch to the other type of cycle. And the main reason for doing that is that um, if one model gets too much better than the other, the other model would basically collapse in training because it's not able it's not able to perform on the same level. Um, so you do need to make sure that you're updating them as evenly as possible. And that can be hard, especially in a setting like this, where one of these tasks is very obviously much, much more challenging than the other. Trying to generate any piece of text that could contain this graph is a completely intractable space. Um, but the opposite is far more restrictive. So we do have to spend more time on, on updating and tuning and trying to fix this uh, text to link data model. Oh, okay, you get to see the cycles. Um, so as I said before, there, there are some complications. The main one is now that we're using two models, well, we've halved the size of our GPU, basically. We, we can only train half the model size. Um, uh, or we can we can unload one model from the GPU. We can then put another another model on there, and then we can just keep switching them back two times two times a circuit. And you spend more time moving data around than you do actually calculating it. So we can't. We have to find some way of resolving those issues. The other one is that this method is primarily meant to be for one to one mappings. Um, you're basically this process is taking two very high dimensional spaces and just trying to align them, make them parallel uh, as much as it can. Uh, and I don't think you're ever going to find a one-to-one -one mapping with language. So, I mean, many authors have already tried this within a linguistic setting. The paper that this work is uh, inspired by, um, who, who already tried this method on, on a, a Wikipedia data set, uh, show that it, it was very effective. In fact, it beat many supervised approaches. So I don't fear too much about that last one, but it is worth keeping in, in mind as we walk, as we go through this. So the main contribution that we're making to the field is to massively reduce the cost of this mechanism. Um, so a very popular approach recently in natural language processing has been the use of low rank adaptation, which is effectively where you take a large, very capable model, and then you attach tiny little uh, uh, like collections of neurons at each layer, and you just train those. And those learn to basically make up the difference between uh, the model, which you've kept the same, and the actual task that you're trying to solve. And this is such a significant improvement, in fact, that you don't just double the memory savings, you get four to five times the memory savings because when you're optimizing the large model, you have to store eight bytes for every single parameter that you have. And if you've now reduced the trainable parameters to 1%, you know, you, you've got a very significant improvement in, uh, in performance. Um, so relating to the other method, uh, I'll go through and just show you how it compares. So we take in our graphical data again, or our text data, we feed it through the model and we feed it back into itself this time, but we've switched the head over to the different one. Um, so then we take that data, we put it in to the model and we get an output, which we then feed into, well, the model, it looks like it's going into the model again, but what we're doing is we're calculating that difference between the predicted sample and the real sample. And it's important to keep this model attached at this point, because this is the one that we want to update. We don't want to switch to the other one and start training it on the other model's behavior. Um, so yeah, I hope that makes sense. 
Um, so probably more interesting to a lot of you is uh, the data that we're using. And I know um, I can't make any mistakes with Lux information here because, well, there's a very significant person in Lux. Um, but we've got a collection of person and object records uh, from Lux, which are in, link, in the linked R profile. Um, and we've, we can add a lot more um, uh, person and object records. Um, but the, the main point is at the moment, we're sticking to these two types because they're quite easy to define and understand as we try and learn how the model behaves and we try and learn how to teach the model to do something useful. Um, latest, later iterations of this project, I do hope to expand it to cover as much as possible. Uh, moving over to the far right, we've got various uh, art historical text sources. So a lot of them are like catalog documents or um, essays about the works at the National Gallery, but there are uh, some other sources in there as well. But really the most important element of this data set is this central one. So a subset of these Lux records had attached to them uh, a URI to Wikipedia that had uh, a good, good abstract to describe that same piece. And why that's important is because these two types of data are very similar. And we can start to try and close the gap between the two data sources. Uh, in this training mechanism, we have the main battle of just trying to overlap the data enough that the models can infer what the relationship should be. So uh, this, this data set is really necessary. I guess as, a, as an example, you, you can't teach something to learn a different language if neither of them know any shared words between the two languages. So once again, with, with kind of every stage, I think in research, um, yes, we've got a solution to the previous problem, but we've now got a whole slew of other problems. And this is where the majority of my time has been going on this project at the minute. So the first problem is, is that we're trying to get it to generate one sample out, but linked data records, you, you don't find a single text that describes that record. And it's the only text that describes that record ever. Um, the information from a text, like a linked data record is, uh, you know, spread across a whole like mass of texts. Um, and so you've got this now one to many problem, which you're having to try and solve. Um, but a potential solution, and I know this isn't a graph, I know this is a tree, but I couldn't, I couldn't draw a graph is basically to make our data worse. Uh, and that sounds counterintuitive, but if you're thinking about it in a realistic setting, there are not many truly like uh, all encompassing text files. And so it's more important that we improve that overlap rather than try and create perfect records every single time. Because what will happen is that the uh, linked data to text model will be fine but the opposite will just learn to hallucinate data because it's expecting to see lots of these records which it can't find in its text. So we want, I mean, obviously we want to really avoid hallucination, especially in a data generation setting. And yeah, this is what I was just saying. It simulates having incomplete records. And the way that we can do this is not purely by a random covering. Um, currently I've been looking at how we can calculate a probability distribution of certain, uh, I guess, branches appearing or certain structures appearing. Um, and also we can look at co-occurrence and then we can start to, to define a probability function that will uh, selectively remove parts of this, this structure relative to the data set that it came from. Yeah, the, the important thing is the only required data is that you must have an identifier. Otherwise, well, you, you, can't, you can't tell what the thing is. So strangely enough, the opposite uh, direction also shares the same problem. Um, texts, although they contain far less dense information, they contain it 
across a number of documents as well, or they they merge a lot of the information from multiple documents into one. Um, so ultimately, we have a many-to-many -many problem, um, although this task is far easier to extract the data from because there's just a lot less of it. The problem that this could cause is um, that the model starts to be, you know, it starts trying to find too many relationships in the data. It starts re reaming off all the things that we don't care about rather than focusing on the actual data related to art history. Um, and again, what we propose to do to resolve this many-to-many -many problem to some extent is to, uh, I haven't decided whether it's purely randomly or somewhat uh, informed, stack uh, a random quality of these previously pruned entities. Um, of course, we want to maintain some single entities. We want to maintain some large, full, complete samples as well. Um, but if we start to stack these, then now we're actually learning this many-to-many -many mapping that we really need. We're learning to generate multiple texts that contain data about multiple entities. Uh, and now less so about aligning the two spaces is more of a um, implementation detail. So being very generous to ourselves and saying that we're using the latest Llama model with 8,096 tokens that we can use. Um, we've already found that unprocessed, uh, the average size of these records that we're receiving are about 13,000 tokens, which isn't great. Um, and the largest of them is 50,000. So we have to cut some of that out. And we, we already do to some extent because we're, uh, tri we're pruning some of these graphs, we're removing uh, structures and nodes. But equally, um, as much as it's really valuable to have a lot of this extra or supplementary data for each for each record, including like different language representations for the same object. Um, it can be reconstructed afterwards. It's more annoying, and it would be better if we could keep it. But um, yeah, ultimately, we we can get it back. And the other thing is that we can um, now probabilistically define the upper bound for these stacks of entities. Uh, and we either stop at um, which one comes first. Is it the max model size or is it that the next uh, next chunk will take it over the, the boundary? We don't want it to have partial chunks in there. So that's the main ones for now, but I'm 100% sure that there will be so many more in the coming months. and. Uh, yeah, it's it's quite an interesting puzzle to solve at quite a high level. So I actually forgot probably one of the most significant things in this presentation, so I'll, I'll hopefully do that now. Um, the, the main benefit of this cycle consistency training with adapters as well is that I'm producing a library which can be used by anybody. Um, and it's based on the well-established Hugging Face trainer API. So if you've used it before, it will be basically the same. Um, in fact, I don't think you really have to change much in the way that you program for it. Uh, but that that is a little way away. Um, but there is a GitHub with my current progress on the code up until this point. So yeah, thank you very much. That was great, William. Um, if you have questions, make sure you get them into chat or in Slack. We'll be asking them at the Q and A at the end. And then up next will be Sasha Fridwell. If you want to get your screen ready to share their presentation. Um, thank you. And absolutely, I'll get it started once um, William's able to take down his. Uh, I am lost in Zoom. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> okay, okay, there we really go. really good at Zoom or really good at Teams, I'm finding. <sighs> okay. And I will introduce Sasha while they are getting set up. Sasha Frizzell is the Catalog and Metadata Management Librarian at Binghamton, Binghamton sorry, University in New York State. Their research includes the history of library 
classification in America and link data for cultural heritage institutions. Like I said before, if they get done early, we will have questions at the end of the session. If not, we'll have them at the very end. The floor is yours. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so this is very different than the last talk you just heard. So this is kind of um, getting to basics. Uh, so here I'm presenting Learning Together Tech Services Linked Data Roundtable. Um, and essentially, um, we hear the question a lot, how do I get started with linked data? I feel like there's a high barrier to entry. I don't know. I don't even know where to get started in a lot of cases. And this presentation was kind of exploring how here at Binghamton University, we got started with a roundtable or a learning group um, in order to kind of build our own confidence and um, see how we could get started and, and kind of dip our toes into linked data. So, Binghamton University uh, Tech Services is both cataloging and acquisitions, and we have roughly 15 people. Um, the folks who have worked here, a lot of them have worked here for a long time, and a lot of them have been in the field for over a decade. So we have a lot of experience here, um, and a lot of folks know a lot of um, different areas of tech services, which is really important when we're starting to look at linked data. But there had never really been a kind of effort to bring everyone together and to start on the professional development track of learning about linked data and possibly starting some implementation with projects here. So in fall of 2023, we kind of started, um, came up with the idea based on and inspired by documentation and other groups. Um, if you're if you've been in part of the LD4 community for a while, you've probably heard of these before. Um, so we kind of took inspiration from those groups and we wanted to be really intentional about this round table. Um, we wanna make sure that it is very open, uh, a very open environment for folks. So there is no question that is too small. We can all ask things. We all feel like it is a safe space to ask those questions. Um, in order to do that, we did keep it just currently to our technical services department because we built that trust and we feel comfortable with one another. Um, we wanted to build the round table off of the curiosities of the members. So we wanted to let folks really explore what they're interested in and kind of um, listen to one another and bring those projects in from different perspectives. Um, but really the, the whole reason for the group for me that I really wanted to start is just to help build our own confidence in being experts and having the expertise in order to move into linked data. So we started this round table. This is what I expected starting out and this is what I pitched to people and it sounded really easy. So I think I got them on board. Um, we started with an initial meeting in January. We're gonna talk, we're gonna see what we wanna talk about, um, kind of touch base with everyone. We'll do a quick February session on an introduction to linked data. I created a lib guide that gave us some foundational instruction uh, for what that might look like. And then in a March, we're going to let people go free. You're going to run your own sessions. You're going to find your projects. You're going to decide what curiosity um, you have and then bring it to us as a group. I didn't want to leave people like totally out in the cold to try to find these things. So we did kind of come up with um, like a resource library in order to start these, these groups. Um, a lot of the resource library and the ones that I always recommend for getting started is, is pulling from the corpus of the LD4 affinity calls. Um, Art and Design and Synopia User Group and Wikidata have been massively helpful in allowing us to see projects from start to finish. We can get really good presentations on those. Um, and the same with the LD4 conference content. So we're going to get a lot of great presentations. Um, sometimes talking about linked data, it can seem very technical and it's hard to see start to finish what um, a project looks like, but the conference content and the affinity group calls gave us a good, um, actually reasonable projects and reasonable goals to set for ourselves. So we pulled a lot of information from there. Um, I wasn't sure if we wanted to go more structured and if we wanted to do something that was like very structured, I thought we could always go through the 23 linked data things. If you're not familiar, they're just kind of like small little sections, um, each covering a separate topic and you could do that very structured. Or looking at something like maybe every month we read a chapter for linked data for the Perplex librarian. Um, we ended up going a little bit more free form, but if you're in a position where you're just starting out and you really want to like have a regiment, uh, those two would be good places to start. I also think it's it's very inviting to actually get your hands on and get into something like an edit-a-thon, either joining one online or um, doing something um, or creating your own. We did one for the Lambda Book Award winners um, in October, 
And as catalogers, it was really nice to see like, okay, this is just um, really complicated data entry. And that's what we do every day, dealing with wiki data, dealing with cataloging. So folks felt uh, more confidence in doing that. And of course we um, are also exploring existing systems that are actually doing linked data. So you can spend a session looking at a system, um, seeing what quirks it is, seeing what the end benefit is to a user. And that sometimes also can make it more tangible when you can actually see what the benefits of adopting some of these linked data practices um, will be for your user at the end of the day. So I pitched the easy one. We made it a little bit more complicated in reality. Um, so we had our initial meeting and it really was about setting goals. It was about harvesting interest and it was about creating a space for collaborative learning um, where all skill levels are important and we want everyone to feel like they have a place at the table. Um, we then did a couple sessions as an introduction to linked data. And we did use that libguide as a basis. We also did looked at um, Wikidata affinity group sessions to kind of see that end-to-end -end project management um, and kind of other project examples, just so we could see how we could actually start to take action and start to take on these projects ourselves. As catalogers, we also had a bib frame day and we leaned on the Sanofia demo from the affinity group for that, which is wonderful, so thank you. Um, and then in July, we sat down very seriously. I said, okay, you guys are gonna have to start leading sessions now. Um, I believe in you, this is gonna be wonderful. And since July, we've actually had two phenomenal sessions. Um, we had uh, Amanda dug really into linked data for biodiversity. So we got to look at some controlled vocabularies. We got to look at linked data systems. Uh, Angela actually did an open refine Wikidata project start to finish, pulled something from our institutional repository and did the Wikidata for that. Um, and coming up, we're gonna be looking at OCLC um, linked data projects. We're gonna be exploring other data catalogs currently in production. So we, we have a couple of really great things coming up. And we've actually kind of started to now build that confidence and build um, more of an expertise within our department. And we're hoping in January to open the group to other folks in the library. So um, we took this year to build up our chops and to build our confidence. Um, but we're hoping that we can start to bring other folks uh, who are interested in the topic in as well um, and start to get some, some bigger projects underway. If you're just getting started and you don't know what that looks like, um, things that I took away from the experience is that learning groups or roundtables like this, you, you really have to go at your own pace and you have to be honest about what that pace is. Try to create an environment where folks feel comfortable actually bringing that information to you. Um, it's been really helpful for us to find topics that interest and inspire us. So we could go and kind of just read through every chapter or we could go and, and go down the line, but it's been helpful to let people dig into what they're interested in um, because if you're passionate about it, I wanna hear about it and everyone else does too. Um, and then try to find places where you can get hands-on um, to really see what linked data looks like in practice. Um, that can be really helpful for um, getting started with linked data if you're kind of at that stage. That's everything I have for you guys today. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, Rory had asked that you, um, is it possible for you to share a link to your LibGuide? Absolutely. And I have the slides um, on Sketch, and that has links to kind of all the resources that I posted, but I'll post it here in the chat too. And then someone else said, it's inspiring to see how group members are exploring their own interests and sharing what they've learned. It's been so wonderful. I'm so excited. Every month I, I'm so excited to see what people have found and um, what people are exploring. It's great. And Darnell was excited because you shouted out their book. Um, I was excited about it because as a new graduate, there are some things I want to get into and it's so hard because I feel like I'm coming in at an instruction level money and the first five pages have been ate by my dog. So this was awesome. Um, we do have a question. So what are the interests of the group? So the big thing, we obviously started out um, because we have bib frame looming and everyone wants to know what the reality of that actually looks like for catalogers. So something we could do that was very practical, um, especially we work in the OMA ILS. So um, we wanted to start looking at what bib frame looks like in OMA um, and what some current uh, bib frame editors look like. Um, but the biodiversity um, talk that we had 
was actually just based out of um, finding a weird controlled vocabulary in a MARC record. And they were like, who is using this controlled vocabulary? It seems like it could be really good for linked data. Um, people are exploring all kinds of things that I would have never brought to the table. So it's been really exciting. We still have a few more minutes if anyone has any other questions for Sasha. You can post them in chat or on the um, Slack channel. And she did put the link for the libguide in chat and I will copy it over into Slack. It's brief. I'm just warning you. There's more to come. I'm I'm working on it. <laughs> I think it's a great. And I find that when you get a group that's pretty open and willing to be honest and candid with each other, they start pulling strings, and that just goes wild. You you, you never know where you're going to end up. So this is great. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, we still have a few minutes. William, are you still on? There was a question in the chat or in um, the Slack channel for you. That we can go uh, ahead no, and I'm, I'm here. Okay, right. so we'll go ahead and hit your question real quick and watch and see if any more pop up for Sasha. Let's see. Someone said, thank you for the presentation. Just to make sure I understand a little more clearly the motivations, possible directions of this work. Once okay. you have finished slash finished your approach, we could have the ability to take free text descriptions covering multiple entities, like a bunch of articles, and generate a robust graph and vice versa. For each of these directions, could you perhaps say more about specific use cases? Like I could see linked data generation from free text would be useful in creating structured information with identifiers and relationships that could be connected to um, existing linked data in general. For the opposite direction, would a use case be creating human readable description for users that may be using a UI that displays information modeled as linked data? Thank you for turning my camera on to me. Uh, yeah, um, I, I mean, you've, you've given, given exactly the motivations of the project. Um, Really, the goal was, well, I wanted to produce a, a tool that could take the National Gallery's data and produce uh, linked data records. And when I spoke with Rob Sanderson at one of the con uh, conferences a while ago, um, he said that he was looking at trying to do the opposite. And I immediately thought of this training mechanism as a way of resolving both of those directions of, of data manipulation. Um, I think what's important to understand with this though, is that it is an unsupervised approach um, and it's a very challenging task. So there is a, a limit to the performance that you will get out of it, which is why I, I try to emphasize as much as possible that if you're using this on a large scale, this is to basically reduce 80% of the grunt work so that you can spend your precious time on refining the data afterwards. Thank you, that was great. Does anybody have any more questions? Oh, there's one. Liam, what type of text are you using? Are these primarily exhibition catalogs or something else? Um, it's a mixture. I, we probably have some exhibition catalogs in there, but I don't know off the top of my head. We definitely have just the uh, catalogs that are sold in the store at the National Gallery. Um, and we've also got, you know, many years of scientific bulletin that have been built up by the gallery on researching the the origins of, of pieces and the pigments within them. Um, and then one source which I'm, I'm debating using is uh, a lot of the bio text from, uh, from uh, Lux and from uh, the Getty vocabularies, because it's reasonably, it's too big for me to include and also it's kind of a summary of 
what's already in the graph. So we could create a very useful overlap between the two as well. Um, of course, there's the Wikipedia uh, abstracts. I've debated going and finding not necessarily more matching abstracts, but just more abstracts in general to have more complete textual records. Uh, the text side of things is a little bit all over the place. <laughs> I'm not seeing any more questions. Yeah, um, thank you so much. And I'm sorry for overrunning. No, no, um, stick around because we'll probably have a few more questions at the end of the next one too. And so if you still have questions, make sure you're getting them in the chat and chatting the presenter. Um, Kelly is next. If Kelly, you want to share your screen, you can go ahead and we'll get started in just a few seconds. Well, maybe a minute or two. That way people are popping in. How is it looking? Looking good. I'm seeing a Google Doc. Okay, I'm gonna try and move things so I'm not constantly looking in this direction. <laughs> and now I've lost. Ah, wrong, wrong screen. Nope. Wrong, correct screen? No. <laughs> Hold on, this is a bit confusing. I do that too when I look at my screens and I'm like, which one do I want to share? And I can still have what I need up on my screen and, and look at it and be like, I'm not sure about that one. Yeah, I'm a bit lost. I'll try and get this sorted. You got this, you got a few minutes. Where even? Now I'll give everyone a heads up while Kelly is getting ready that after this session is a break. And then when you come back, it will be a new Zoom link. So, um, and we'll get try to get that posted in the chat before the end of the session. Um, and then make sure you get your questions in the chat. These have been some really interesting sessions. I can see your blue presentation now. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're going to get started. I'm going to introduce uh, managing the LOD ecosystem. Whose job is it anyways? This is Kelly Davis, is the cultural heritage data engineer on Yale's uh, LUX project, um, a pioneering cross collection platform in the link data sphere. Her expertise lies in data transformation and remediation. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Sound is great. Great. And it is actually Lux, unlike everything else in our field. Thank it's not you. an acronym <laughs> this <you>. time. <laughs> Okay, great. So as mentioned, I'm Kelly Davis, the cultural heritage data engineer on Yale's Lux project. And today I'm talking, I'm giving a lightning talk on managing the LOD ecosystem. Uh, whose job is it anyway? So for years, organizations have been releasing their linked data authority records with reciprocal relationships encoded in properties such as OWL same as or SCOS exact match. The URIs in these properties point to other records across the LOD ecosystem that are theoretically describing the same entity, but published by another organization. Um, these organizations have been following their own data management principles and best practices in creating those relationships. And large scale projects that leverage them have been fairly rare. So any inaccuracies in the relationships have remained dormant. 
However, with the launch of Lux, Yale's Cross Collections linked open data discovery portal in June of 2023, this dynamic has changed. Lux reveals the technical and research debt that has accumulated across the cultural heritage field, particularly in authority control and consistency in property usage. I'm going to be doing a longer form presentation on Lux today at uh, 345. Um, so hopefully you can join for that if you want to learn more about what it is as a platform, how it works, and how we accomplished it at Yale. But first, what do I mean by a reciprocal relationship? Basically, and this is just as an example, if the Library of Congress name authority file has a record for Pablo Picasso, they would use a same as property to point to other URIs across the linked data ecosystem that are theoretically the same authority record for Pablo Picasso, just published by another organization. Sometimes these additions could be done programmatically by, by the organization or entirely manually, or usually I think it's something in between like Open Refine's Reconciliation Service or the LCCN bot, which is programmatic but relies on a team of report maintainers of which I'm a member. Um, and there is a presentation on that work tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. <clears throat> this presentation is in no way suggesting that organi organizations should not publish their authorities as linked data, nor do I think we should come together to publish single URIs for entities. It is good and necessary that multiple institutions create different URIs for the same entity. No one organization will have all the information about something. So pulling them together and creating a single record, leveraging all that information is part of the linked data dream. So as mentioned until recently, there have not been large scale platforms leveraging these relationships across the linked data ecosystem to create or enrich their own records. However, Lux does exactly that. So, did I lose it? No, I'm there, okay. So this is Pablo Picasso's um, record in Lux as it stands today, enriched um, by various sources, which you can see down here um, are different sources, but all of the information that is taken from those sources to create his one record. My longer form presentation on Lux goes into more depth on the reconciliation and enrichment process, but basically after harvesting records from internal and external sources, we use equivalent properties in those records to merge together data from those sources. We either completely create person, group, place, or concept records uh, with that data, or we supplement internal records already existing with data from external records. So we have to work at scale in Lux. I think we have 41 million records, which expanded to triples is around 2 billion triples. So our reconciliation process has to be entirely automatic. And again, we're an aggregator. So we're not really doing the authority work ourselves. We're instead trusting that the URIs in reciprocal relationships are accurate. And at the moment, there's no way to detect errors until after the record is built. So building some kind of test to check if reconciliation is correct while the pipeline is running, like if we were to compare birth dates for people records or broader relationships on concept records or latitude and longitude on place records, if we tried to add some kind of test like that into our pipeline process, it would slow it down um, to failure. So it's already a very computationally intensive process. Uh, it's not really possible to check if the URIs are correct um, in that process right now. So as a side note, when I first started hearing about linked data, maybe in 2015 or 2016, um, and a person was giving a presentation on linked open data at my old job, and he was asked this exact question. So how can linked open data ensure accuracy when following programmatically following connections in the knowledge graph? And the answer was that it would work something like a scholarly citation, as in the best connection would float to the top. Well, that was eight years ago, uh, prior to large scale implementations like Lux. And I think we can confidently say at this junction that that was incorrect. It doesn't work that way. Uh, at the base level of implementation, all the URI connections are treated as equally correct. And as I'm, I'll mention pointedly more later, no one organization is more responsible for bad connections or has better data necessarily than another. So Picasso's record here is one where things are working really well. The reconciliation from the sources is all correct. Um, there's not another person mixed up into here. And we have a lovely singular record representing Picasso, nicely enriched from multiple sources. However, 
uh, more often than that, the opposite might be true. So due to any number of mistakes done either programmatically, manually, or something in between, the URIs and these proper the equivalent properties are not actually the same as each other. And when these errors occur in the ecosystem, they're often repeated by other institutions, none of which would have the resources to check every connection for accuracy. And Picasso is just an example, and this is not actually in the data. So LC, you have nothing to worry about with this record, you're fine. Um, I'm just using this as, you know, for a fun example. There's lots and lots of examples of incorrect matches though. So I could probably talk for 15 minutes just about some of those examples. Um, some are very funny, like when Cher the person was reconciled to Cher the town in France. Um, some are very strange. Um, we're pretty sure there was some kind of bad translation somewhere along the line that led to a concept of shellfish getting, uh, you know, having an equivalent property to a concept of door. So every object in Yale's uh, university art gallery that was a door had an object type of shellfish. So it had to be something about the hinges probably um, with translation. But don't even get me started on the reconciliation nightmare that we currently have of Viola's the instrument, Viola's the plant, Viola's the bug species, and Viola the character from Twelfth Night. So I've been recently working on detangling that whole mess. So very common are things that are similar to each other, but not exactly the same being put in this equivalency property in the data. So Library of Congress has and utilizes a close match property, but sometimes they use it as close match and sometimes they use it as same as. Um, and we and Lux treat it as same as um, because, you know, we don't actually have a close match property. Um, and since half the time or more than half the time they are same as, we just say it's same as, even though sometimes it's not. Uh, and a lot of other organizations just use a property that, you know, we might, in, th that is, seems like it's a total equivalency or is called same as, but they might not actually mean it that way when they, when they use it. So for example, I found that BNF records, uh, the, the French National Library, um, they had records for each arrondissement in Paris, but in the equivalent URI on all of them, um, they pointed to the GeoNames record for Paris, the entire city. So maybe this is intentional on their part, but maybe not. So aligning on what same as means um, across our field would be a great start in cleaning up some of those problem matches. To quickly just answer the question, uh, any equivalent properties, so so both. I Linked art is actually our, our data ontology. So in any of the other uh, data so linked data sources we use, we would just um, map it to equivalent in linked art. These are only the examples, though, um, when there's a determinable right or wrong alignment. So most of the time, it's actually easy for me to say the match is correct. Like if I have a record for Picasso and it says it's, you know, Jeff Koons, whoops. It says it's Jeff Koons. I, I know that that's not correct. That's a really obvious example. Um, however, sometimes it can be far more complicated than that. So I have a conceptual question of what point does an entity become a different entity and where do we as a field draw the line? Most organizations would distinguish between painting the object type and painting the technique and they would have two concepts for it, but it is easy to see how that could get confused in reconciliation processes. And organizations might not agree where the line is drawn. Language is a very tricky thing, uh, not to mention multiple languages as we incorporate a few European uh, libraries. And some concepts could be argued as being the same, while uh, some organizations might say that they're different. There's also inst uh, different institutional practices coming into play then. So Lux at the moment doesn't handle changes over time very well in that we would probably merge together companies who change names and then separated or remerged or something like that over time. But other institutions that we leverage would probably have different rep records for them um, and maybe connect them via some kind of uh, property. And then there's potentially convert, uh, controversial connections like political ones. Um, for example, merges of Taiwan with China. So I am not an expert on the history and foreign relations of East Asian countries, but I have to play that role and assert my own opinion based on quick research in detangling the two so that Taiwan is treated as a distinct entity in Lux. And it's not just bad equivalencies in data that cause inaccurate information coming across in our Lux records, but also sometimes just plain incorrect data. 
So again, we enrich our records with information like names, birth dates, genders, and nationalities, all of which are potentially, if not only offensive, then sometimes even dangerous if we're getting it wrong. I personally have the opinion that gender is not a classification uh, that an authority record should record, but Lux does contain this information. And I've recently spent some time cleaning up records that had both male and female in their genders. So incorrect information coming across in one or more of our contributing sources. We've also had to deal with incorrect nationalities. There is a problem um, with some sources consistently referring to people born in Morocco with a nationality of French. So it's amazing how much outdated information is still coming through in our collective authority records. However, again, I'm faced with the same dilemma of being an authority on something that I'm not an authority on. Lux is an aggregator. We're not a data creator. Um, so I, it's a strange position to have to make that decision. I have to quote the big Lebowski to myself often in the, uh, that's just like your opinion, man. So these can be sensitive subjects. And, you know, I would prefer, I think on some level that Lux didn't include some of those classifications. But while we are providing them, um, we aim for as much accuracy and sensitivity as we can. So overall, we currently have a number of badly reconciled records in Lux as a result of just, you know, following the equivalent URIs. We've squashed probably 600 bad relationships across approximately just 200 Lux records. So to be honest, this feels like a drop in the bucket of what I know is there. And we can only squash that connection in Lux. So the original error is going to still exist in the organization's data. Lux uses both internal and external sources to create our records. If the error is coming from an internal source, I can fix that quite easily. I can go to the unit. We own our own data. We can fix it in the source. However, I don't have any ability for the majority of external sources. So this is how we're fixing them. Um, a very technical, very data engineered Google, Google spreadsheet, which the data pipeline checks at the end of our reconciliation process and on hinges entities from each other as needed. So I'm manually adding them to this sheet. It's not efficient and it's only a band-aid for the actual problem. I do have a close working relationship with the Getty vocabularies who are quite responsive in fixing errors that occur in their data. And I can of course edit a Wikidata record and hope a bad or simply misguided actor doesn't come behind me and re-add the incorrect match. But all of our other external sources are a little bit of a black box to me. And as I spend considerable time just tracking down these errors and fixing them here, taking on the added burden of externing, uh, emailing these external organizations if I even knew who to contact. To let them know about the errors would be very inefficient again. But if you work at one of these institutions that we leverage and you'd like to see this list, please let me know. I'm happy to share it. So my purpose today is not to point the finger at any one institution because all of us are capable of making mistakes. Instead, I'm ringing an alarm bell. So until machine learning or AI is capable of entity recognition and discernment at the same level as a human brain, which while we do have some hopes for this is not currently the case, everyone utilizing the LOD ecosystem's wealth of authority records will face this issue. So again, anyone who's planning on using equivalency um, relationships at scale uh, across our cultural heritage linked open data ecosystem will be incorporating these bad equivalencies along with the good. There's just no way around it without some kind of massive scale cleanup. So I wanna wrap up by posing a number of questions to our community. If these properties are to be effectively leveraged, who's responsible for maintaining best practices? Again, uh, it seems every institution is doing this on their own with their own institutional kind of perspective, but I would actually argue that we're all responsible for maintaining the best practices and creating best practices, but how would that work out in reality? Is there some kind of way that we could come together to take a good look at these records and establish uh, those best practices for property usage and you know what same as really means? And what is actually achievable given everyone's lack of resources and the perpetually unsexy metadata cleanup challenge that we all face? So I do not have these answers myself, but would love to participate or begin these conversations. So please get in touch. My email is here and you can also contact me on LinkedIn. Thank you all. Thank you, Kelly. That was great. 
And I know we do have two questions. If those of you have questions, you can put them in the chat or you can put them in Slack as well. Oh, they're not that day. Sorry. We gotta see at least one pet throughout the day. Um, okay, question one. What's the name space? Um, and then are we talking about owl same as or schema same as? Yeah, sorry, I did uh, answer this mid presentation, but uh, Lux uses linked art as our data model. So we take anything that's not linked art and map it to linked art and use um, uh, linked arts equivalent property for anything that we might find in the sources, any any of the ontologies that we might find in the sources we're using. Okay. And then the next question is, is Lux exploring anything that isn't a true false? But more of a complex uh, and no. a relationship. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I mean, I think when we first started talking about doing this kind of thing, there was an idea of sort of ranking the confidence. Um, but it's just not it's not doesn't seem to be feasible in the scale that we're working at. Um that would be really cool though. Uh that would be nice if we could do that. One thing we can we can't even put in every record where each piece of information is coming from. All we can do is list the data sources um, that can that, you know, compile the entire record, but not like specifically where each piece uh, comes from. I can do that through some legwork, but we can't um, do it programmatically like when we're building the records. We, we could, it just would take too, um, too much um, computational overhead. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions? There was a comment that's one of the community conversations that's needed. I yeah. I think in response to that, I would say that Yale um, was okay with taking risks with locks. And so this sort of plus minus of accuracy is something that they're accepting right now. But we're, of course, exploring how we can improve. I think when you try anything new, you gotta be willing to to take a little uncomfortableness in that and see what happens. Does anybody else have any good questions? I also like the Spider-Man picture. Very appropriate use. Um, I'm not seeing anything in Slack and I'm not seeing anything in chat. And of course, if you are in chat, you can, in the Zoom, link, you can unmute and talk to yourself. If you have a question and you don't want to type it out, go ahead and unmute. I think I just have a statement more than a question. I think it was very unfortunate putting us both in the same presentation block and hearing that my data relies on that. No, it's it's much better than than most other records I've looked at, so I'm still confident. Sounds like it's like an ongoing conversation. And I mean, it's given these different forms where you can both even present to say like, this is the output. And then someone else is like, I'm using your output for, for this other work. It all kind of is like a, a giant like daisy chain in some ways. So I appreciate that there's just openness and explaining like, you know, this might not be 100%, but we're working to, you know, come up with some solutions given the resources that we have to have it be more um, sustainable. Kelly, there was one more question. Um, do any of the PCC participants at Yale help correct errors in the LC vocabularies? Uh, no, we we don't usually do that. Well, I guess yes, I guess yes, because a lot of times um, if it's a Yale library record, that's the problem, they might need to go and the, the real problem is actually maybe coming from LC then. Um, so yes, but that takes place within the library and um, I'm not actually in the library, but yeah, I mean, when we, when I, when I get errors, if it's an internal, internal data source of some, of any type, I would just feed it back 
if I can track it down to that, I would just feed it back to the unit that the record is coming from. But by the time I see the record, it's already in link.art format. Um, so they then need to go into their source system and do what they need. But probably, yes, they probably do sometimes then need to go into LC. We don't have such a giant amount of people working on locks um, that might be surprising. So I think there's only maybe a small handful of staff at the library who even see the errors. Maybe even look at the ones that do see the errors and you're probably like, I don't know what that's it. Let me pass it on. <laughs> because we have that a lot at my library. So. Yeah, I have, you know, um, since the LCCN bot, which is tomorrow at 1030, you should come to that because it's talking about this as well. But I've been able to share the spreadsheet with that group. And I know that there's been some cleanup uh, as a result of that. But any cleanup so often just feels like this drop in the bucket because it's like record by record. Uh, and we're dealing with such scale of, you know, the, the kind of accumulated research debt 